great to see you all. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Gary Dowell. For those who don't know us or haven't seen us for a while, I'm the chair of the Irish Train and Wear branch. Um, I have just a couple of things to say before we kick off with our event today. Um, don't forget, after the event, it, and let me just reassure everybody, this event is a lot shorter than the last one because it was our AGM and legal updates last month. So this, this event is a lot shorter this time. Um, as I say, don't forget after the event to do your online survey of how you like today's event. Um, and that's at branch meeting feedback at iosh.com. You will receive an email as normal. So please, please do the feedback because it's very valuable to us as a committee because we look at it um, and then we also plan our next events and, and schedule around that as well. But we also take all the comments on board, which is great. Um, we have roughly had about 40, 40 feedback comments last time, um, or who completed the feedback, which was great. Um, and it covered general things like the COVID related issues for those who attended. Um, it also told us about the um, amount of time that we gave to the legal update which we could have which we will improve upon for the next annual general meeting so 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 don't worry i do take all the comments on board um additionally for all the newcastle construction safety group members any feedback that you would like to give us from dr neil's presentation is greatly much appreciated and also any comments that you want to make with regards to the brand very much appreciated again just contact the secretary on the Newcastle Construction Safety Group a normal email website that you normally get through on the safety group. And then those questions will be fed back through to myself um, for, for, uh, for inspection and perusal. All right, so, so I'm trying to include all, all people here, right? Um, questions. Now, because we have a, no, a lot of people attending today, as you know, we roughly get about 15 minutes for the questions um, at the end of the presentation. Um, I just want to introduce our, uh, my, my friend and colleague and executive committee member, which is Caroline Brown. She will be acting as our Q&A facilitator today, and she will go through the questions at the end, um, covering any questions with Dr. Neil Stanley and giving the answers. So please put your questions in the chat room area um, of Zoom, as, as you normally do, and then Caroline will feed them back after, after the presentation's finished. Additionally, we have we have our uh, um, our regional IOSH regional manager, which is Helen Pichu Mali, who's keeping an eye on the event today in the background. Thanks, Helen, for that. Just to make sure that I'm keeping things moving and um, doing a smooth transition, if you like, with things and everything's working okay. So she's in the background there, keeping we're all right. If you have any questions for IOSH specifically relating to IOSH topics, please email Helen and uh, not email in the chat room, right? Please drop a question in the chat room and Helen will discuss that personally with you, all right? So, without me waffling on anymore, let's get on with today's event, right? I'm looking forward to this, like I do with all my events, but I, I just want to know how Neil's going to handle this today, right? I'm going to introduce Dr. Neil Stanley in a moment. He's a sleep consultant specialist in sleep, mental health and safety. So Neil, without putting you too much on the spot, over to you and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, let's uh, do sharing screens. Uh, share, and then that should work. Please let me know if you can't see my slides moving. Uh, anyway, uh, yes, thanks very much. Uh, I think we initially uh, had contact uh, back in 2018, I think was the first time. So nothing like being three years late with giving a presentation. So uh, I'm going to talk about sleep, mental health and safety. My name is Dr. Neil Stanley. As you can see, I'm a PhD. So I'm not a medic. I'm a proper doctor. Uh, I'm a freelance sleep expert who's been involved in sleep research for the last 39 years. Uh, I've worked uh, across Europe uh, and looking at sleep research and sleep medicine. I'm a member of the things you should be a member of as a sleep expert. I've published 38 scientific papers on all aspects of sleep, from medicines and sleep, job stress, rumination and sleep, uh, couples and sleep, even walking to the South Pole and sleep. Um, not only am I a freelance sleep expert, but I'm also director of sleep science at 
Sleep Station, uh, which is an online provider of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, um, which is now the first line treatment for insomnia and, and poor sleep, uh, according to the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. And uh, the good news is that Sleep Station is a Newcastle uh, company based in Newcastle uh, and has affiliation with the, the hospital, with NUFT. Um, and, and so at the very end, I'll just do a, a quick, uh, let you know what Sleep Station is, uh, just because it may be interesting to you as an, as an individual or you as a, a, a company, uh, <coughs> the services that it may be able to provide for, uh, for uh, helping your workforce sleep better. Anyway, so why is fatigue alertness management important? Well, to be honest, most people uh, attend to their nutrition and exercise. Um, people have adopted those messages really quite well, but they perhaps fail to recognize the importance of actually getting a good night's sleep. Um, but sleep provides the foundation of optimal alertness and performance. It's critical to health, wellness and longevity. And it's a vital physical need. You have to do it uh, to survive. It's like food, water and air. You can't avoid doing it. So uh, it seems strange that people have all these processes in place or they're, they're, they're trying to eat healthily, they're trying to exercise, but they forget about sleep. So a few years ago, I came up with this, the well-being triangle. We have nutrition, exercise, and we have sleep. Sleep's at the bottom because it supports the other two. If you want to eat healthily, the most important thing you can do is get a good night's sleep because then you won't crave sugary and fatty foods as much. If you want to exercise effectively, the first thing you should fix is getting a good night's sleep because if you don't, you're much more prone to having a sleep sports-related injury. So sleep supports these other two well-being behaviors. So I'm safe at work, so it doesn't matter if I'm sleepy. How many times have you heard that? I've been doing this job for years. I, I'm a professional. I'm trained to the uh, back teeth, and I literally could do this job in my sleep. So it doesn't really matter if I'm sleepy. Well, that's complete nonsense. Uh, it uh, Poor sleep increases uh, your uh, uh, reaction time, you have slower reaction time, impaired judgment, decision making, decline in attention, decreased alertness, increased moodiness and aggressive behavior and difficulty remembering things. But it doesn't matter because even if you were sleepy, you'd know you would stop working. You'd take yourself out of that dangerous situation because you'd know you were sleepy. You'd have those warning signs and you'd go and do something better and safer. Well, that's wrong as well. The more sleepy you are, the less able you are to judge your sleepiness. Um, so uh, I was involved in a, uh, a, a campaign with the Department of Transport a few years ago saying the first yawn is too late. Uh, by the time you know you're sleepy, you've been acting sleepy for a very long time. So it's not good enough to believe that there will be some uh, warning sign. You hope that warning sign will be a yawn. Uh, it may actually be a catastrophe, catastrophic falling asleep at the wheel. Um, so how sleepy are you now on a scale of one to ten? How sleepy are you now? One, if I were to stop talking for a second, you'd instantly fall asleep. And ten, you are the most awake you have ever been. To answer that seriously, so, you know, to, to take a moment and reflect on how sleepy you are. Sleepy is not being cheesed off with life. Sleepy is not the fact that the sun's disappeared and it's grey cloud and it's Thursday and it's miserable and you haven't won the Euro Millions lottery. It's not, not being miserable. It's about how sleepy. If you could lie down now, how sleepy are you? Because you wouldn't turn up to work drunk, so why would you turn up to work sleepy? If you're an eight hour a night person uh, and you only had six hours sleep last night, that's the equivalent of drinking two bottles of beer, four hours sleep, four beers, two hours sleep, five beers, zero hours sleep, seven beers. You would not turn up to work sleepy. Indeed, it would be a disciplinary offense if you turned up to work sleepy and right, uh, sorry, uh, if you turned up to drunk, uh, drunk and rightly so. But you would turn up to work sleepy even though your impairment is the same. It, the, your tasks are impaired in the same way as that amount 
of alcohol. And you work, uh, you know, I've worked with uh, safety critical industries in the past. And, you know, when the drivers are out, uh, you know, they, they are allowed a couple of beers with their evening meal um, because they're up early the next day to drive. Um, but that's something you can monitor. You can monitor the alcohol, but can you monitor their sleep and ensure they're getting a good night's sleep and are ready to roll for the next day? So what is the impact of poor sleep? Well, uh, accidents and injuries, uh, disabilities, absenteeism, not turning up to work, presenteeism. Uh, I don't know if any of you know what this is, but that's basically being at work and doing nothing, uh, you know, playing on Facebook, staring out the window and work productivity and performance loss. So why do we sleep? Well, we're not absolutely certain. Uh, it's still quite a mystery. We know it's important for physical and mental functioning, repair and recuperation. It's important for our body systems, including our immune system. And if you get one poor night's sleep, the next day you're four times more likely to catch the common cold, for instance. It affects all organs of the body, but primarily sleep is of the brain and for the brain. The brain is the bit of sleep, the, a bit of the body that must have sleep. So in any one 24-hour period, you're in one of three distinct states of being. You're either awake, which hopefully you all are still now, or you're in non-rapid eye movement sleep, or you're in rapid eye movement sleep. Now, REM and non-REM are as different from each other as they are from awake. You don't notice that difference because, of course, you're asleep. But essentially, uh, what happens... Uh, in non-REM sleep is that it's divided into uh, different stages of sleep. So stage one is the transition from awake to asleep. So it's the lightest stage of sleep, makes up about 5% of the night. So if you're awake and you're gonna go to sleep, you'll go through stage one sleep. Uh, stage two, around 50% of the night, um, you'd have thought the thing we spend 50% of the night doing would be really important. Uh, it probably is, we just don't know why. And then we have deep slow wave sleep. Slow wave sleep is the most important part of sleep. Slow wave sleep is the bit of sleep that makes you think like you've had a good night's sleep. It's the bit of sleep that allows you to be awake during the day. And it's involved in memory, learning and growth. Um, and then rapid eye movement sleep makes up the last 25% of the night. Rapid eye movement sleep is when you have your long story-like dreams. Everybody dreams, everybody dreams four or five times a night, but you can only remember a dream if you wake up during it. If you don't wake up, the dream is gone and it's gone forever. And your deep and your REM sleep is involved in emotional memory. So deep sleep is about factual memories, what happened. REM sleep is about how do I feel about what happened. So how is sleep put together? Well, this is a very typical night for a very typical adult. Within essentially 20 minutes of you switching the light off, you should fall asleep. All things being equal, a healthy adult will fall asleep within 20 minutes. Regularly taking more than 30 minutes to fall asleep would be a sign of insomnia, but also falling asleep too quickly. Falling asleep the minute your head hits the pillow would also be a sign that there's a problem. You are sleep deprived. Once you've fallen asleep, you'll quickly go through your lightest stage of sleep and then into your first period of deep sleep so about 20 minutes after you fall asleep you'll be in your first period of deep sleep you'll have a consolidated period of deep sleep for maybe 40 to 60 minutes and then you'll have your first dreaming or REM period that REM period may only last five minutes ten minutes long and then back into some more deep sleep and then on a roughly 90 minute cycle you have your REM periods uh, interspersed with that lighter stage two sleep. So most of the deep restorative sleep is in the first third of the night. So how much sleep do you need? Well, all, if all of you are coursing at the screen, I know this one, it's eight hours. Well, you're all horribly wrong. Eight hours is an average, it is not an ideal. No one of any eminence uh, in the last 600 years has ever recommended we all need eight hours. Sleep need is individual uh, and it's to a great extent genetically determined. So some people only need four hours sleep to feel at their best. Others need 11 hours to feel that good. I personally know I need 30, um, I need nine and a half hours sleep a night to feel at my best. And if I only got eight hours, I'd actually feel pretty ropey the next day. So it's about getting the right amount of sleep for you. So how much sleep do you need? Well, it can be answered by one question. That question is, how do you feel awake? How do you feel 
during the day? Do you feel awake, alert, focused during the day? Or do you feel tired during the day? Now, if you feel tired during the day, that's got nothing to do with being sleepy. That's got to do with having a bit of a rubbish life. What you want to know is how sleepy you are. And we asked that question uh, a few minutes ago. How sleepy are you now? Um, because I say sleep is that desire to lie down and sleep. Tired is just not feeling great. So that's the difference. If you climb up three flights of stairs, do you need a sit down or do you need a sleep? If you need a sit down, you are tired, fatigued, knackered, exhausted. If you need a sleep, you are sleepy. So sleepy people are the ones with the problem. So uh, what is fatigue? What is this? thing uh, that we call fatigue or sleepiness or whatever it's the inability to function at an optimal level uh, because you cannot cope with the situation and there are many different things for this the duration and intensity of work not getting the enough sleep uh, that has a cumulative effect uh, and working at inappropriate times in your circadian cycle so this is the circadian rhythm. Your body is governed by a circadian rhythm and by a homeostatic sleep drive. Now your homeostatic sleep drive basically is just time on task. The longer you've been awake, the more likely you are to fall asleep at the end of that. So after a day of 16 to 18 hours, you are liable from a sleep drive point of view to want to go to sleep. The circadian rhythm is your own individual genetic time clock that tells you when you are awake and when you are a bit sleepy. So the good news is that around about now is as good as it's going to get for you today. Um, so you wake up and you're on your rising phase. Uh, and so I say around about now is as good as it's going to get. And then it's a bit downhill. Um, for your post-lunch dip, which actually does not involve uh, having to eat food. You have this as a natural dip. And then you get a bit of a boost in the evening, uh, and then you go to bed. And the lowest point in your day is around three o'clock in the morning. Uh, three to four o'clock in the morning is roughly when you hit your lowest point. Uh, and as you can see, that until around uh, six o'clock in the morning, uh, you are pretty hopeless uh, in order to do anything at all. So how does uh, that uh, circadian rhythm transfer into uh, actually doing uh, something, doing a job? Well, these are the errors made in meter readings, uh, how long it takes a spinner to um, fix a broken thread and answering phone calls. And as you can see, around about that low point at four o'clock in the morning, you are really, really uh, deficient in your performance. And you can also see, as I say, uh, there is that boost in the evening for, for many people. Uh, so that's uh, what it actually does to you. So, um, the number of hours you've been awake, uh, as I say, that, that uh, homeostatic sleep drive, the longer that you are awake past around sort of 16 hours or so, uh, the worse your performance gets. And it keeps getting worse with every hour of wakefulness. There's no rebound uh, because the sun's come up uh, the next day. Uh, so that's the uh, area where you're looking at issues happening uh, where you start going below your normal ability to be awake and actually to think and do things. Uh, and this translates to uh, truck driving. So here are how long uh, people have been driving and their relative risk. So you can see past uh, you know, six hours or so, you're really starting to ramp up those uh, risk factors. Now, uh, one thing I uh, need to mention also around your circadian rhythm is the fact that some people are morning people and some people are evening people. Again, this is genetically determined and you cannot uh, train yourself to be the opposite. You can cope with getting up early if you're a night person, but you're never going to be at your best. So an early morning person, a lark like myself, uh, has no problem. Uh, waking up and starting work at five o'clock in the morning, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, 
completely bloody useless past nine o'clock at night. Owls much more likely to be wanting to get up at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, going to bed at sort of, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning. Um, of course, larks are much better just in general, uh, but they're also much better um, for the nine to five day. For us going to work at nine o'clock is not a problem. For an owl to go to work at nine o'clock in the morning is difficult for them. And to go to work even before that, they're going to be massively sleep uh, deprived because of this. Um, there is a questionnaire, the Horn and Ostberg morningness and eveningness questionnaire. And if you run a company, I would suggest you get your workforce to do the Horn and Ostberg. And the people who are morning person put on the early shift and the people who are evening person, people put them on the late shift. Everybody will be so much happier. Your accidents and your illnesses will go back, uh, down. Your workforce will be happier. And it's as simple as that. So as I say, uh, evening people getting up in the morning uh, have this thing called sleep inertia which is this grogginess that they get um, when they wake up early. And this affects their memory, their performance, uh, slowed speech, and it can take one or so hours to clear. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, people, again, with subjective alertness and cognitive throughput, it takes some people some good, good amount of time to get to what they normally are. And you know this, you all know that person. Uh, who is completely blooming useless for the first two hours of the day. Uh, they resort to caffeine and uh, nicotine and just are miserable, moody people that you just seek to avoid. Well, these are basically night people who are having to get up early, but sleep inertia can really affect your ability to perform in those first few hours of the day. So uh, sleepy People uh, are now as big a threat on the roads as drunk drivers, of course, partially to do with uh, the lack of people drinking and driving. Um, but uh, they account for about 23% uh, of highway accidents, but 83% of highway fatalities. Um, the reason for this is because if you um, are drunk, you do something. Now, it might be something completely inappropriate, but you do something. You break late, you swerve, you do something. If you fall asleep at the wheel, you don't do anything. So you hit what you're going to hit really, really hard. That's the why the police know that it's a sleep related crash. There are no skid marks on the road. Worst times for accidents, two to seven o'clock in the morning. And there's a, a, a smaller peak in accidents around the mid-afternoon. Basically, uh, nobody should be driving a motor vehicle between two and seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and if you translate uh, again the number of hours in bed to your uh, breath alcohol level, uh, as you can see, uh, this is the European level of 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.05 in the UK, 0. 0 0.08. Um, but you can see if you had four hours of sleep last night, you are over the drink driving limit for the UK. And if you had no sleep last night, you are well over twice uh, the drink driving limit in the UK. So that is why it is a problem. So uh, people who uh, have uh, seven to eight hours sleep a 1.2 percent higher risk if you have five to six hours sleep a night that is three times higher risk of a motor vehicle accident when you talk to anybody uh, and you say uh, i've got a way of reducing accidents by three times uh, people would go for it you tell them to get a good night's sleep they'll suddenly decide that they don't want to do it anymore and the thing is, sleep deprivation is cumulative. Every day that you have a bad night's sleep, your, your performance decrement increases. So this is mean sleepiness score. This is your subjective sleepiness. This is your number of lapses. Lapses is missing a signal. So if you're driving along, missing the car brake lights in front of you or missing a red warning light, you can see every day you get three hours of sleep your number of lapses increases uh, and your mean speed, your ability to react to that lapse or to that signal, again, increases across seven days. So 
it's not like you're making up for it each night you are getting worse and worse and the problem is this is a slightly difficult graph so bear with me essentially if you have two weeks of six hours sleep a night that is like at the end of that two week period you are performing like you've had no sleep for two whole nights okay so by friday after next if you only have six hours sleep a night it will be like on that friday you performing as though you had not slept for two whole nights but because going back to what i said earlier you don't know that you are deprived you don't know that you're sleepy because you're not being able to judge that so what happens uh, impaired hand eye coordination slow response time lowered visual discrimination reduced alertness increased error reduced logical reasoning problems with your short-term memory can't concentrate frustration irritability uh, can't make decisions injuries and accidents and these are all measurable uh, and they are all uh, meaningful and they're all something you can do something about so uh, this big study done showed that uh, there's an increase uh, in the number of accidents after the ninth hour of work so working long hours uh, you massively increase your accident risk um so again uh, you know uh, i'm good to go i'm just a little bit sleepy or i'm good to go i'm just a little bit drunk how can you rationalize those two as being different from each other we've done this accidents time of day uh, if you're driving along at 60 miles an hour and you fall asleep at the wheel it'll take your car four seconds to come off the road uh, try it next time you're on a long straight road get your car up to 60 uh, take your hands off the wheel and count slowly to four i promise you around three it gets really really exciting please god don't do that um micro sleeps uh you know you, when your head nods and you wake up and you think well where did the last uh, mile and a half go uh, you have no awareness of this actually happening all you actually notice uh, sometimes is to say is your head jolting back but other times you may be completely unconscious that micro sleeps last one and a half two seconds so you're halfway towards a crash uh, just simply doing that uh, i think we've done all of those uh, so what happens uh, if you're fatigued well the ability to comprehend complex situations without distraction um, being able to monitor events uh, being able to not lose your focus uh, and also being able to think about uh, how to do a task how to work a workaround how to see an easier way of doing something the ability to assess risk or avoid risk taking behavior the more sleep deprived you are the more you're willing to take risks um and that can be anything um you know, to, you know to just not really caring uh, the inability to innovate and think laterally to solve a problem if you're confronted so again this goes back to yes you can do the job that you're trained to do without a problem um it's when something goes wrong how do you react how can you get out of that problem um a lack of interest i don't care i don't care how this goes i don't care if i inconvenience somebody by what i've done i don't care if it's un uh, unsafe I'm, I'm just not willing to put in the effort mood and behavior uh, you know the sleepy people in the office they're the miserable ones ones without any sense of humor but we also find it more difficult there's more aggressive behavior more conflict with our colleagues with our partners um we don't read body language we don't understand tone of voice um so people uh, get offended by things we say or do um <clears throat> not being able to monitor your own performance uh, so wanting somebody else to tell you that you're screwing up and this is of course what uh, happens in uh, Australian hospitals there's the buddy system that there is somebody there who is there to you know monitor what you do and you monitor what they're doing and there is the culture of people being able to say to you look you're screwing up stop it 
uh, whereas that culture perhaps doesn't exist in many industries uh, where things are, you know, that would lead to a confrontation rather than seeing it as a learning event. Um, recollection of timing of events. You know, if you're doing a process, did you do it in the right order? Did you do that uh, thing in the right order? And is your remembrance of doing it uh, at odds with how you actually did do it? So, as I say, how do you know you're not getting enough sleep? Um, you or other people notice your work performance is not up to your standard. You find yourself nodding off during talks about sleep um, or in your breaks, in your lunches. Um, you, you find it more difficult to do your work and you take, uh, diff uh, take longer to accomplish the task. You have difficulty focusing. You're not motivated and you become impatient uh, with everybody. So uh, you want to counteract these problems. So what doesn't work well if you are sleepy turning up the radio opening the car window uh, turning the aircon up singing or talking to yourself uh, eating chewing gum drinking fluids makes absolutely no difference at all if you're driving along and you feel sleepy and you turn the radio up and you wind the window down all that will mean is that you die listening to radio to slightly colder than you were before that is it they make no difference at all this is why the signs on the side of the motorway say uh, you know tiredness kills take a break they mean it they don't mean wind the window down um, so what can help eating a healthy diet drinking the requisite amount of water uh, having an exercise routine even if that's just taking the stairs you don't have to put on lycra to exercise uh, long naps uh, if you are very sleep deprived a three or four hour long nap will boost your performance <coughs> for uh, another 12 hours a shorter nap can restore uh, your performance for three to four hours um, caffeine used during the day is a bit of a waste of time caffeine only is beneficial if you really are quite sleep deprived um, but it shouldn't really be relied on uh, and you know don't just sit get up and, and move around a bit um, what else can you do um, wake up and go to bed at the same time every day if you can uh, of course shift work uh, or flexible working hours messes that up um, but actually that's probably one of the most effective ways of improving sleep uh, established a, a consistent and comforting bedtime routine doesn't matter what you do as long as you do something don't watch the clock lying in bed going oh my god uh, you know, if I don't get sleep now, I'll never get the sleep I need. Uh, so I must fall asleep in the next 10 minutes. Oh, God, I still haven't fallen asleep. I, you know, that's really terrible. I'm not going. So don't watch your clock. Um, if you are sensitive to caffeine, avoid caffeine. Don't use alcohol as a sleep aid. A small tot of whiskey or a small sherry before bed never harmed anybody. Um, but too much alcohol will put you to sleep really well, but it will destroy your sleep in the latter part of the night. And don't fall, don't lie awake uh, or, uh, you know, being awake in bed, getting more comfortable, and more frustrated. Get out of bed, go somewhere quiet, do something relaxing and go back to bed when you feel sleepy again. So as I say, naps are, are beneficial, um, but you don't want to have too long a nap. So you either want to do 30 minutes or you want to do two hours. Anything between that, you may wake up in that deep sleep and feel rubbish, having that sleep inertia. Caffeine, it takes 30 minutes to work. Um, it can boost uh, your performance, but um, caffeine, uh, coffee per se, is a bad drug delivery system. Uh, you don't know how much caffeine there is in any cup of coffee. Uh, so if you want to rely on caffeine, then I would suggest you use functional energy drinks, which is just a clever way of saying Red Bull, because at least it's got a declared content of caffeine. You don't know how much caffeine any cup of coffee has. You may actually be getting no caffeine at all. Um, and, um, you know, don't, if you're working night shift, use caffeine to keep you awake, because that will just stop you from falling asleep when you are meant to be sleeping during the day. Um, there's just uh, in the last part we'll deal with mental health uh, this is a, a wonderful quote the subject of sleepiness is once more under public discussion the hurry and the excitement of modern life 
is held to be responsible for much of the insomnia of which we hear. And most of the articles and letters are full of good advice uh, to live more quietly and of the platitudes concerning the harmfulness of rush and worry. The pity of it is that so many people are unable to follow this good advice and are obliged to live a life of anxiety and high tension. Well, you would have thought that was a relatively modern quote, but actually it's from 1894. So we've been stressed and worried for a very, very long time indeed. Um, one of the problems with uh, sleep and mental health is that it's bi-directional. Many people with mood disturbances have a complaint of insomnia, but insomnia is also much more likely to cause you to have a mood disorder. So it's a chicken and egg situation, what comes first? Depression and things like that are a major, major problem. Um, and so we need to be aware of the possible contribution of poor sleep into mental health problems and also whether by treating the mental health, we also should be doing something about sleep. Stress and sleep, a lot of people are stressed. The thing is, um, stress is a normal, stress is actually good uh, to a degree. Stress is the thing that keeps you alive um, because it is the thing that makes you think, have I left the uh, oven on uh, when I go out the house? Have I got the plane tickets when you're driving to the airport? That's stress, that's good. Um, but stress is negative for sleep because stress uh, puts you into a fight or flight response, uh, which is you know, either run away or hit something, uh, which is exactly the last thing you need to do before you go to sleep. So you, say you have this non-specific uh, response requiring your body to do something. Now, some stress, as I say, is good. Uh, having a deadline to work to, if you're a writer like myself, is good to have that stress because it actually makes me motivated to do it. Knowing that I have to give this lecture at 10 o'clock means I'm motivated this morning to put my slide deck together, which I've been putting off for months. Uh, that's a good stress, but this stress is bad and we react negatively to it. So as I say, uh, we have a sense of urgency, which is positive, but we have that negative stress that can harm our mental, physical and spiritual health. So as I say, we're in this fight or flight, which is a protective tactic, but as I say, it is completely against getting a good night's sleep. And the problem is a good night's sleep is probably the best cure for stress and so again we're in a chicken and egg situation so um how do you get a good night's sleep uh, very very simple five points a strong promote strong uh, sleep promoting environment dark quiet cool comfortable dark when i say dark i mean pitch black uh, even a few candle lights in your bedroom would be sufficient to disturb sleep. So blackout blinds, eye masks, whatever. Moderate temperature, 16 to 18 degrees. In order to get a good night's sleep, you have to lose, lose one degree of body temperature. You lose that body temperature out of your head and face because it's the big fleshy thing that sticks out from under your duvet. So you need a cool temperature in order for you to dissipate that heat. So 16 to 18 degrees. Quiet, the World Health Organization says background noise, 35 decibels, intermittent peaks of 45 decibels. Your average snore, 65 to 90 decibels. So get rid of them, uh, as simple as that. Uh, well ventilated, fresh air is good for sleep. And as I say, uh, comfortable. Um, most people seem to have spent less on their bed than they have on their mobile phone. Uh, that would suggest that priorities are slightly wrong. Strong association between sleep and the bed. Get into your bed to sleep. That is the only thing you're allowed to do in bed. Um, you are not allowed to stream Netflix, chat with your friends on Facebook or anything like that. So when you get into bed, you sleep. And if you aren't, uh, asleep then get out of bed. Relaxed mind and body. Well the body you can be absolutely physically exhausted and still not fall asleep um, so it's about the mind. You need to have a relaxed mind. How do you relax your mind? Don't know. Uh, I know what I do. I read every night. That might not work for you so what do you want to do? Well drink chamomile tea, drink horlicks, practice mindfulness, do yoga, listen to Pink Floyd really loudly. I don't care what you do as long as you do something before you go to bed that winds you down from the work. Put your stresses and strains of the day to bed long before you get 
to bed. Not no direct efforts towards sleep. Lying in bed going, I must get sleep, 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 isn't going to help you get sleep. Simple as that. An absence of regular thought processes about your sleep. Oh God, if I don't get a good night's sleep tonight, then I'm not going to uh, be able to perform well tomorrow and I'll, I'll make a mistake and the boss will notice and he'll sack me and then I won't be able to pay my mortgage and I'll lose the house and the wife will divorce me and I'll die in a cardboard box under the A1. I can't sleep now, can I? So don't think about your sleep, as Nike would say, just do it. Have a quiet mind, relaxed body and a comfortable bedroom and you will get a good night's sleep, all things being equal. So that's uh, the advice very simply on how to get a good night's sleep. But as I say, uh, I do work as a director of sleep science at Sleep Station. I say this is not an advert. Uh, for Sleep Station at all. But Sleep Station uh, was developed around 10 years ago. Uh, and as I say, it's based on, on the quayside in Newcastle. Uh, and what it does is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is now, according to the NICE guidelines, the first line treatment for poor sleep. If you have poor sleep, CBTI is the therapy that you should be undertaking. Um, and so what happens is that basically it's uh, it's an online provider, it's, uh, it's video and uh, text context uh, that you can do, as long as you have access to the internet, you can do CBTI uh, with sleep station. You don't have to go to see a therapist. Uh, as I say, it's cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. It's based on the latest research. It's developed by experts like myself, backed by science, and it is NHS improved. Uh, it's easy to access, as I say, if you've got access to uh, the computer, you can do it. It's proven to work. About 80% of people who do it get much better sleep. And it's personal. We have human sleep coaches that actually help answer your questions, encourage you, uh, providing support for you through the process. Uh, and so, as I say, it's, uh, there's a secure messaging system for people to uh, contact sleep station uh, and, and and talk to our sleep coaches uh, as to you know what they want to do um, and this is Sarah a 40 year old engineer before sleep station she had a sleep efficiency of 75 percent now sleep efficiency is total sleep time divided by time in bed so if you're in bed for eight hours and you're asleep for eight hours you'd have a sleep efficiency of 100 percent well that's never going to happen 95 is probably as good as you're going to get um, uh, but anything below 85 would be considered insomnia so sarah uh, had an, a sleep efficiency around 75 percent and as you can see she had quite a high depression score after just four sessions with sleep station uh, you can see her sleep efficiency is up at 94 percent which is probably as good as you're ever going to get and her depression even though we don't address the depressions uh, her depression score has actually dropped and she says she's uh, sleeping better and she's very grateful brian uh, a very very similar a story. Uh, she found it very useful uh, and recommended it to his colleagues. Uh, so if any of you are interested in Sleep Station, either for yourself or for your company or as an organisation, as a charity, whatever, sleepstation.org.uk is where you should go if you're interested about that. But if you're interested in me, that's my email address. That's me saying thank you. That's who I am. Uh, and dead on time for 15 minutes questions, I will actually now stop sharing and uh, answer your questions should you have any thank you very much um you're sharing your screen so stop share that's probably the way i wanted to do it we've had quite a few questions um we've had two people asking a very similar one actually and that is should we be taking a nap to counter the post lunch slump um well, yeah, I mean, the, the whole point of the post-lunch dip was that uh, from an evolutionary point of view, it's too hot to actually go out and uh, hunt or anything. So the safest thing to do was go under a shady tree and sit there. And if you're sitting there, you might as well have a nap. So from, a, from an evolutionary point of view, certainly if you feel sleepy in that post-lunch dip, having a 20-minute nap is going to be far more effective than it would be to have two strong black cups of coffee or walk around or a cigarette or whatever. Um, but we shouldn't really need to nap if you've had a good enough sleep at night, essentially is the point. OK, 
Okay, and someone has asked if we can compensate for lost sleep by sleeping extra hours at the weekend. No, you can't. And this is one of the great myths. Actually, uh, remember one of the points that I said was to have a regular bedtime and wake up time. Um, the reason for the regular wake up time is that your body and brain starts waking up around 90 minutes before you wake up. So if you fix your wake up time, then uh, your body knows that that's when you're going to wake up and you're going to wake up feeling good. Um, so if you if you muck about with that at the weekend by trying to catch up on sleep, one, you can't catch up on sleep and two, you'll muck up that routine and catching up at sleep at the weekend is why you have the Monday morning feeling. It's as simple as that. Um, that's why you feel rubbish on a Monday morning. So it's about routine and regularity and it's about getting a good night's sleep every night. It's a bit like asking. You know, if I if all week I eat McDonald's and then at the weekend I just eat lettuce, is that a healthy diet? Well, of course it isn't. Um, and it's the same with sleep. You need to endeavour to get a good night's sleep every night. We've also had a couple of questions about shift workers. For example, how do we deal with the dip in the early hours of the morning for people who are working shifts? Well, shift working is a problem. Um, and, and there's no great easy answer for this, unfortunately. Um, the, the classic textbook on shift work uh, was written uh, back in the 70s by Tim Monk and Simon Folkard, and it's called How to Make Shift Work Tolerable. Um, and that's as good as you're going to get, tolerable. It isn't going to get any better than that. Um, the, the issue is, of course, um, if you work a daytime, you come home, you have your tea, you watch some telly, and about four or five hours after you've finished work, you think about going to bed. With a night shift, you literally come home, you have a meal, which you're not quite certain whether it's dinner or breakfast, and then because you're so, so shattered, you instantly go to sleep. So the things that may help you in that dip, like taking caffeine, um, you know, if you have a dip in the afternoon, taking caffeine's fine because it will be out of your system by the time you go to bed. But if you have caffeine in that very early part of the morning, that's going to stop you sleeping when you go to bed in the day. And that's going to be difficult enough for you. So if you'll have me back at some time in the future, I'm more than happy to do a presentation on shift work. I mean, I don't know how many of your members work shifts or anything. I've got a wonderful presentation about uh, shift work, what you can do, how you can do it, how you can design it, because that's one of the other things. Shift work in the UK isn't designed scientifically. You get the 24 hour day, you just cut that into three portions and that's it. And the idea is saying, um, you know, that, the, the, uh, uh, we measure morningness and eveningness. You know, no company, well, a few of the trucking companies do, but no other companies really do that at all. Um, put the morning people on the morning shift. They're going to be so much happier. Put the evening people on the evening shift. Don't make everybody rotate because you're going to piss off everybody. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Uh, and that doesn't seem to make sense. Someone's asked if we can train the body to need less sleep. No, uh, in the same way that I couldn't train myself to be less than one meter 97 when I travel Ryanair, it's genetically determined. Um, you can learn to cope, but you'll never be at your best. And what's interesting is that nobody ever asks that question about anything else. You know, you never get somebody saying, oh, can I learn to do less exercise? Can I learn to sit on my ass watching TV more? Can I learn to eat more unhealthy? Why would you want to do something that is so good for you? Why would you want to do less of it? Surely the question should be, I want to do even more uh, of this stuff, not how can you get by with less? And why do you think that sleeping patterns have been affected so much during the pandemic? Well, what's interesting is that the data actually shows that there's been two responses to the pandemic. Um, 
about 30% of people are sleeping much worse and about 30% of people are actually sleeping much better. Uh, the people who are sleeping much better are people like myself, people who used to travel a lot, get up on the early train to go and give a lecture, getting home at God knows what time. And now I can sleep when I want. You know, you can't go out of the evening. So you, I can go to bed whenever I feel sleepy and I can wake up when I naturally wake up because I don't have to set an alarm. So for me, the pandemic has been brilliant. But for other people, there has been a situation where the lack of routine is the problem. Um, they think, well, because I don't have to get up for the early morning train, I can binge watch Netflix until God knows when, because it doesn't really matter, because all I'm going to do is sit on a Zoom call like this. Um, and, and the other thing is, of course, anxiety. Um, you know, during COVID, we've all been scared witless <laughs> by various uh, you know, we, and, it, and, and the thing is, we can't escape it. It's not like um, it's, it's something that's only affected a small part of the population. Everybody has been exposed to the news stories and the anxiety. And of course, anxiety is the enemy of sleep. You, it stops you having that quiet mind. Someone's wondering if there are any adjustments we could make to help people with sleep apnea. You know, I, I assume, I mean, employees coming into the workplace and might be well, affected by that. Yeah, I mean, sleep apnea is a, is a problem. Sleep apnea, for those of you who don't know, is the uh, is where you pause breathing repeatedly during the night. Um, and these pauses can last from 10 to 10 seconds up to 180 seconds. And you do this repeatedly. Some people will pause breathing for you know 300 times a night. Uh, the problem with sleep apnea is that it destroys your sleep because each time you obstruct and it's a blockage in the upper airway, you wake up short term. So you never get the deep reflection sleep. And also sleep apnea is massively uh, problematical uh, for increasing things like uh, uh, stroke or heart, heart disease. Um, main causes of sleep apnea are... Uh, just the upper airway anatomy, which can be fixed uh, surgically, um, or a bit too much weight for many people. Uh, CPAP therapy, where you wear a mask which blows air through the airway to keep the airway patent, is highly effective, but the problem is it's a bit of a pain for the person to use, and the NHS use really quite old equipment rather than some of the very newest stuff, which may be you know, much better or much more uh, acceptable to uh, the people who wear it. So if you have got people in your company who have got sleep apnea, then offering to fund them uh, privately and getting them, uh, you know, the best latest CPAP quiet machines with the best masks on uh, would, be a, would be, you know, something that may make them use it. And th the thing is with CPAP, if you don't wear it, it don't work. If you do wear it, it's pretty much like magic. And are there any general things we should be doing to encourage good sleep among our employees? Well, there's two ways of doing this. One is to be nice to them. And this is some companies in America are doing this, which is paying you to sleep well. So you give everybody a sleep tracker. And then if they all get a good night's sleep, you, you give them some money for each good night's sleep they've had. Um, or there's the other way, which is um, you say to them, well, you have a responsibility to turn up to work capable of doing your job. And therefore sleepiness will now be seen in the same way as alcohol. Now, of course, you know, some people, you know, if you're, if you're, um, you know, if you're a nursing mother or nursing father, it may be difficult. Um, but a person who is sleepy is a health and safety risk in exactly the same way that they are drunk. So if you were in a safety critical industry, I would be testing for sleepiness. And if people are sleepy, I'd send them home. And if people are repeatedly sleepy without good cause, then that should be a disciplinary offence. You know, I would I would much prefer to get in a car with a sleepy person than I would, oh, sorry, with a drunk person than with a sleepy person. Because at least the drunk person 
knows they're drunk. A sleepy person doesn't. So they're the risk factor. That's the problem. They don't know that they're screwing up. Whereas, you know, drunks are overcautious. Everything they do is overcautious, isn't it? Um, uh, they, they try hard. Whereas a sleepy person thinks, I'm fine. Again, as I say, you know, I've, I've done this a million times. It's not a problem. Some companies may have employees who are menopausal and that might impact on their sleep. Should this be part of a company's menopause policy? Oh, absolutely. There should be, you know, menopause. There is, you know, we do know there is a, a problem. The problem is the temperature. The problem is, is, is the, 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 the hot flashes in there. But yes, I mean, sleep should be part of the company policy. Now, of course, there's not a lot you can do because people uh, sleep when they're not on company time. But I say it's about creating that culture. The, the you know, I say the, the carrot and the stick. The carrot is, you know, you're better, you're happier, you're healthier, pushing that message about sleep. But the stick is if you're not sleeping well, you should do something about it. And we as a company are going to give you an inf information. So if you have got menopausal women, there should be, you know, a, a, a paragraph about sleep and the menopause that you can give to these women and say, well, look, you know, this if you do this, this, this and this, then potentially you will sleep better. Um, and as I say, companies do a lot, um, but they don't do that much about sleep. Sleep is, is as I say, because it's not done on your premises. It's something you just hope people do, but are you giving them a reason for do, doing this? You know, lorries have tachographs, which measure whether the lorry is moving, but the lorry's not the problem. <laughs> it's the person driving it. And just because the lorry stopped doesn't mean that the driver has stopped <laughs> or is resting. We've got it the wrong way round. We're missing the, the weak link, which is the human. The lorry can go on forever. Uh, and this is so much, you know, we've, mis we've made machines safer for humans to use. We just haven't made the human safer. And it's the human that screws up. The head of safety at the, CA, uh, at the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, says that 90 five percent of all aviation crashes are now human error then nothing to do aircraft don't just fall out the sky anymore the idiot driving them breaks them that's the problem that's what we've got to get around you can have the safest possible workplace but the minute you introduce a sleepy person safety's gone out the window it's as simple as that in exactly the same way as introducing a drunk person you keep drunk people away from the sharp stuff. You should be keeping sleepy people away from them. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we've got time to, to squeeze in one more question, but someone's asking why it is we can sort of find ourselves yawning when we wake up after what's felt like a good night's sleep? Because yawning has got nothing to do with sleep. Yawning is non-verbal communication saying that everything is well in the world. Everything is good in the world, which is why yawning is contagious. Um, because essentially from a, you know, back in our prehistory, we'd all sit around the fire and at some point somebody would say it's time to go to bed. And we did that by yawning because we didn't show our teeth. It wasn't a threat gesture. Gorillas do it. Chimpanzees do it. Uh, and we yawn back saying, yeah, everything's good in the world. Everything's great. It's time for bed. And yawning in the morning is just saying, yeah, I had a good night's sleep. All's well. Everything's good. Um, so I say it's got nothing to do with sleep. It's got everything to do with feeling safe and secure. Okay, that's great. Thanks. There's been a lot of positive feedback in the chat as well. Thank you. Well, that's very lovely to have. Okay. Thanks very much, Caroline, for doing a fantastic job. Um, okay, everybody. Just I'm just going to just uh, wrap this up before long. Um, I just want to thank Dr. Neil Stanley. Uh, for fantastic presentations, one of the best that I've attended um, for a long time. So thank you very much for that. And I'm sure everybody's got something from that to take back to their workplaces. So that's, you know, some of the, some of the things that's been covered has been absolutely fantastic. 